it's been a while since we covered one of the comic store in your future uh, newsletters, articles, whatever you want to call them, from Rod Lamberti from Rodman Comics in Iowa. They come out on Bleeding Cool, and it's definitely one of the things that Bleeding Cool used to put out pretty regularly that was definitely worth checking out. He's a pretty straight shooter, very honest about the state of comic books, certain uh, enthusiasm for comic books themselves and what he's doing, but you can definitely tell it's been a tough few years for him, and we've been getting less of these articles out as of late. And I guess recently he was on vacation and he watched a comic store country, something like that, comic book country. I guess it's a documentary on Amazon. I've never watched it personally. I guess he checked it out, started looking into some of the people that were featured in the documentary, what they had to say, and was noticing some things that were real issues five years ago when the documentary was put out that are still major issues today. And you can hear the frustration in the man's voice. And when Rod Lamberti speaks, I like to listen and give my point of view and my follow-up on that kind of stuff. And that's what we're going to do right now. Topics such as the quality of comic books and problems with pull boxes, the same things that were plaguing comic stores then still are now. Quality has not improved and sales are sliding. As a comic store owner, I always try to put on a brave face. One of the reasons I opened my comic book store was I thought that as a business owner, I would have greater control over my destiny. I was so wrong. I may like certain comic book characters and have my favorites, but if publishers aren't putting out titles people want, they aren't buying them, you can't force someone to eat a spit sandwich. And that's about as straight shooter as you're going to get from a comic book retailer kind of opening up and talking about their experiences. Obviously, he was watching that documentary and noticing the same problems plaguing comic books five years later, no changes enacted. Basically, they're putting out the same low-quality comic books with a few exceptions here and there, and it's becoming more and more difficult as people believe less and less in the Marvel brand and the DC brand that when you buy this, you get a certain minimum standard of quality, that it's at least going to be all right. And I think the, the minimum standard of quality at Marvel and DC right now is pretty bad. Like, we get far more bad comic books than we should get, and even an average book really stands out as being pretty darn good. Like, I would say the current Ultimate Black Panther is a very, very average comic book. Stands out as being pretty darn good at Marvel Comics. You know, there, there are a lot of instances of things of that nature that people are like, oh, yeah, this is really good. Like that Moon Knight run from Jed McKay. You know, it felt awesome in the moment. But I think when people look back on it, it's not really going to stand up to the Doug Mensch stuff. Because that was actually good, and it's very average right now. And average feels like a godsend in this climate. And you can hear uh, the frustration in the riding voice of Rod Lamberti there saying, you know, I, I try to put on a brave face, but I can only sell what's good. If people aren't interested in the characters and the writers, you know, they're not going to buy in. And it makes my job very difficult. And obviously, Marvel and DC aren't listening to anybody because I've been talking about this for six years now. You know, uh, your boy Zach's been doing, I think, over eight years at this point. You know, Doug Ernst has been on the front lines for a long time. There are a lot of voices out there that have been spelling this out. Rod Lamberti has been very honest about what's going on here. And we've seen other retailers as well. Phil Boyle down in Florida stands out as another outspoken voice that have been pointing out the same exact issues. Hey, you actually need to try to write good stories. And what we have is an audience that's completely changing away from a reader-based audience. And that's something that he brought up in another paragraph that I thought was very, very informative. A business owner can do everything right and still go out of business through no fault of their own. When I first opened a decade ago, the main reason people were getting comics was to read them. As time has passed, there have been fewer and fewer readings and more and more collecting. Variant covers are now overshadowing the stories behind them. I click on a news article about an upcoming comic, and often the variant covers have more attention paid to them than the comic book story, artists, or writers within. When I order new comics, only a few writers now move the sales needle at my store. It is far more likely that variant covers move the sales needle instead. And this has been an enormous problem at Marvel and DC. That's why we're seeing this oversaturation of the collector's aspect of the market because there have always been readers and collectors and you got speculators in there. And if you do the Venn diagram, obviously there's going to be some overlap in them, but you're seeing far more the readers walking away, the people that are going to not only buy the first issue, 
the second issue, but are still going to be there when you get to issue 15, 30, 50, 100, because they're actually enjoying the story and they have a reason to stick around. Not many comic books give you a reason to stick around. I think we just hit Batman 150. Started out uh, with much acclaim from Tom King. I've gone back and, and looked at that series, and I think it was pretty bad from the beginning. But there for a while, it was a very hot comic book. Never got quite to the Scott Snyder Batman run levels of sales, but was very successful. We get to Batman 50. They promised something. They didn't deliver it. The numbers start dying off. They bring in James Tynan to replace Tom King about 30 issues early. The numbers spike up again. He leaves for Substack. Then they bring in Josh Williamson, I think, for a spell. And then it's Chip Zdarsky, and his run has been low. And if you look at the totality of that 150-issue run, there's nothing really that should have kept anybody around other than the fact that they're like a Batman completionist. Because the reading isn't there. It's not very good. And they continuously reboot all these stories to where you can't really buy in on anything. And as a reader, you are disincentivized to go out there and support your favorite hero or character or story or writer or whatever, because you know it's almost guaranteed to be temporary. And with a lot of writers nowadays, even if they tell a good story, and I think Batman Offworld is a fantastic story. It's only a miniseries, nothing really to buy into there from Jason Aaron, but go read his Namor series. Not very good. Go read his little Superman stint on Action Cobble Books. Very, very average stuff. And these writers are all over the board and they're not focused in on telling good stories and therefore, nobody's moving the needles other than artists on variant covers, which has created another problem to where you have these artists that don't need to do interiors anymore. They can just do 25 variant covers in a month and make more money than they could, you know, illustrating a series that was really, really popular that got people invested in the comic book and had them coming in every single week. And now you have people going out of business, even though they're doing the best they can, they're selling the books the best they can. And when we have all this like turnover, just constant churn back to number ones and writers and all this stuff. Rod Lombardi and Phil Boyle and my good friend Yule Carter, they have to go out there and sell the people that were already reading the book to come back and buy it again because that's a jumping off point. And this constant focus on variant covers is absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It has done so much harm. Uh, to comic books just as a medium of storytelling. And he's completely right. If you go read uh, the articles about Mystique number one coming out this week, are they about the writer? Are they about the story? Or are they about the 20 variant covers that are coming out on the first issue? It's all about the variant covers, which is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm not saying for sake collectors or collectors are bad. Obviously, they're, they're an integral part of the comic book industry itself and the ecosphere and everything that's been created. But it's so overwhelmingly going towards collectors that readers have no choice but to walk away and find something else to spend their money on and to invest in because there's no reason to invest in Marvel and DC. They won't even keep a series going. The people who come in frequently think we are sold out of something, though we aren't because they don't realize that multiple covers are involved. In Deadpool and Wolverine, WW3 issue 2, the Stormbreakers variant cover has two characters and no one knows who they are. Certainly not Deadpool or Wolverine. The covers do not even have a title. So those who want to read the comic book think it's another title they are not interested in. People often think we are sold out of Amazing Spider-Man when we still have the Stormbreakers variant cover and Disney variants of the issue. The lack of basic marketing for comics is unreal. And that's crazy. You know, I didn't even realize this was becoming such a big problem. You know, you see so many variant covers, you almost get overwhelmed because I'm not a collector. I don't invest in variant covers. If you like variant covers, I think if that's your thing, that's what you should do. But it's so unimportant and uninteresting to me that I don't pay a whole lot of attention. Once I realize an article or a piece of marketing is about variant covers, I just tune out and I move on to something that I'm actually interested in. But you look at that cover that he's talking about, and obviously I showed it right there. There's no way of knowing that is a Deadpool and Wolverine comic book. Neither of the characters there. There's no trade dress identifying it. It's just a Stormbreakers comic book. Because the comic book itself, the material within the cover and the back page, is insignificant. It's unimportant to Marvel Comics as a business entity. It's just a collectible. It's a tchotchke to sell that people can, you know, maybe get graded or throw in some, you know, poly bag it, throw it in a box, 
and then forget it ever came out and not even realize that they actually bought a Deadpool and Wolverine book because you're actually just buying the Stormbreakers like stupid variant cover. And that's ridiculous. And the marketing in comic books is absolutely terrible. The only time they ever market anything is in products that the people who are aware that this is coming out already are already buying. Like they never marketed to anybody new. Like how does anybody ever discover comic books other than like maybe YouTube? Or maybe you just go out there and do it on your own. It's not because Marvel and DC are making sure that you're aware of it. You know, they're not out there going, hey, you're a Facebook user. You like Deadpool and Wolverine movie? Here, look at all these Deadpool and Wolverine comic books. You should go to your comic book shop right now. They don't do any of that stuff. They never invest any time or money or effort into marketing this. And now they've gotten so lazy that the cover of a lot of these issues is just art. It has nothing to do with the comic book itself. How would you even know that was a Deadpool and Wolverine comic book unless you asked the, the owner? And even in that case, why would you? Because you'd be like, well, those are two characters I'm not interested in. I don't even know who they are. Why would I want to buy that comic book? That leads to zero impulse purchases. That leads to zero people going through them and like, oh, wow, I didn't realize Joe freaking Casey is on a Deadpool and Wolverine series. I got to check that out. Like, that's not going to happen. You might have some people that are like, that's my favorite Stormbreaker artist, which I don't think happens all that often. But maybe enough that they continuously do this stupid ploy. And I can imagine the frustration that not only Rod Lamberti and Phil Boyle and Neil Carter, but retailers all over the world are feeling because Marvel and DC are not helping them sell any of this stuff. And they basically don't treat them as periodic storytelling anymore. They just treat them as collectibles. They're baseball cards. They're Pokemon cards. They're everything in the world, but an actual story that should be read because of the quality of the merit of the writers and the artists. And that is an enormous folly on the part of Marvel and DC. These are the final things that Rob and Barry talked about that I thought were interesting. Starting in July, DC Comics will no longer be sold on Tuesdays. All new comics will be sold on Wednesdays. No one asked me, of course. Why am I disappointed? I have customers that come in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. As a retail business owner, I want that. The more times people come in, the more chances there are of them buying something. New comics weren't always sold on Wednesdays. When DC started selling on Tuesdays after the COVID shutdown, Tuesdays and Wednesdays became great sales days. As a store owner, why would I tell people not to come here more than once a week? And obviously, Rodman Comics were embracing the concept of New Comic Tuesday and New Comic Wednesday, and they were trying to make them both must-visit days. You know, obviously, I imagine uh, beyond that, the weekends are when people show up and there's foot traffic. And I thought it was a smart idea, but I know there were so many retailers that you would hear talk about this and almost brag about it. Like we don't even put out our DC books on Tuesday or whatever uh, the other publishers that are with Lunar are now. We just wait and do it all on Wednesday. To save yourself some work, I kind of understand that, but why? If you have customers champing at the bit to get into your store on Tuesday and read the latest Batman or Superman or Absolute Power or whatever the book is that cannot wait to get into your store on Tuesday to get Batman or Superman or Absolute Power, that are kind of come back the next day, that's awesome. That gives you extra chances to not only sell them more cobble books, but anything else in the store. You know, you show up, you get your Batman, you get your absolute power if you're still supporting Mark Wade, which I am not. And maybe you spot something out of Corey Rye. You heard about that Ghost Machine book, but you're not quite ready because you haven't decided what you want to do on Marvel. You come back the next day, you get your two Marvel books, you have enough money for one or two more books left over, and you go and grab that thing that you'd been kind of window shopping the day before. Multiple visits to the shop is an awesome thing, and New Comic Tuesday certainly incentivized that. I don't understand the enormous pushback against it in the first place, but I do understand why people would be disappointed that it would go back to just Wednesday, because now there's one day a week, if you're a comic book collector, you got a pull box or whatever, that you have to get into your comic book shop. It's Wednesday. Maybe you come in on the weekend or whatever, because... I know that's the place to be, but now there's one less reason to be in your comic book shop on Tuesday, which I think sucks. And it certainly hurts people that were really embracing the new comic Tuesday, new comic Wednesday flavor of what was being offered that opportunity when DC Comics decided to move to Tuesday. I thought it was a great opportunity. Obviously, it wasn't going to work out everywhere, but it was a way to get people in the shop and seeing your products uh, more than once a week. And I, I think it was a good idea to begin with. It doesn't sound like it was embraced by a lot of retailers, but it sounds like at least one of them who did embrace it is really going to miss it. 
because it made another day of the week a great sales day. And comic book retailers need that more now than they ever have because the quality is dwindling. There has not been one thing that's happened over the last 36 months that should give you or I or anybody hope that Marvel and DC have recognized they have an enormous quality issue in their lines. Sure, we've got all in coming around. They just reshuffled the decks with the same writers. You know, now Jason Aaron has come into DC Comics. What was Jason Aaron doing at Marvel Comics besides ruining characters? His Avengers run sucked. His Punisher run sucked. The second half of his Thor run sucked. His Conan the Barbarian started out well, sucked in the middle, and ended on a pretty decent note. Other than that, he hadn't been doing much. I wouldn't expect much out of Absolute Superman. And if you are, I think you're probably going to be disappointed. It's the same failed writers. Kelly Thompson is on one of the three major Absolute Universe titles. That should tell you all you need to know about the quality associated with Absolute Universe. It's not a top priority, but I imagine we'll be getting more variant covers than you can possibly fucking eat when this Absolute Universe launches off, because that's going to be the focus. How do we make these collectibles extra collectible? How do we create false scarcity and all that stuff so people feel like they have to buy this or they'll never get a chance to you know, without reading it. And they'll just throw it in the corner and like, yeah, I got one copy. And that's just kind of the way the business is. And you you have to feel for people like Rod Lombardi and Phil Boyle and Yule Carter and all the other retailers out there. I wish everybody was having the best year in the history of their business. Um, it's unfortunate that's not happening. It is happening for some people, but it's not happening for enough retailers right now because there's an enormous lack of quality across the board and they're treating comic books as collectibles Rather than entertainment, it doesn't matter what's in between the pages as long as you've got a variant cover on it. And maybe we can sell the same people the same exact copy of a comic book 10 times over with new skins on it. And that's basically what the industry has become. And, and I'm glad we do have retailers like Rod Lamberti uh, speaking out and giving honest assessments about what's going on. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of that right now, but I'll continue to cover all this kind of stuff. If you would like more conversations around comic books, the state of the industry, uh, everything that's going on, comic book reviews. We have a mission here on Thinking Critical YouTube to provide some honesty to the comic book industry, something that they do not want. And if you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, you can go over to Thinking Critical Patreon, and I want to give back for your support in the form of awesome podcasts, breaking all this stuff down and lots more going around with the industry and just geek culture in general. If you haven't checked out Thinking Critical Patreon, there's a link in the video description. I hope to see you there.